The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, the IRS. Can they use computers to keep taxpayers honest? Also, computers in the workplace, new designs and new problems. Later, a review of shortwave radios and a look at the first phone-in drive through computerized supermarket. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. I'm Nicholas Johnson. Welcome to this edition of the New Tech Times. Most of the time on this show, we're concerned about the impact of products in our homes, video cassette recorders, computers, telephones. We know that government agencies and corporations use computers, but it doesn't really affect us much until they goof it up and we can't seem to get a response from a human being. But there's one agency's computers we do need to know about, and that's the Internal Revenue Service. Computers read the returns and check the math, select the ones to be audited, and cross-check returns and records of income. Like to know more? Here's Gary Probst's report. It's that time of year again. You're filling out your tax return. You try to be accurate and honest, but you don't have receipts for all of your deductions. You worry and wonder, will this be the return that causes your first audit? Many people fear the IRS. They have no idea who reviews their 1040. Sometimes it's a machine. Internal Revenue Offices are becoming highly automated, computerized paper factories. Well, we believe that the equipment uh, will be able to process the returns and other documents that we are required to process uh, more efficiently, faster, which will mean less uh, need for people handling the documents. And uh, in that way, it will pay for the equipment. Optical scanners are being used to look over tax forms. Before the scanners, people had to transcribe numbers off the forms into the IRS computers. The scanner actually reads the numbers through a video camera and records them through a computer disk. The machine will notify a person if there are any mistakes. All of that happens as fast as a human can blink an eye. Well, the equipment essentially is, is reading uh, the information right off the returns. It is not somebody else looking at the information and trying to transcribe it. Now, if the taxpayer has entered the information incorrectly, then that is what the equipment will uh, read and pick up. However, other computer checks should identify that it is erroneous or it is not balanced, and someone else will then have to go back and, and math verify the document and, and correct it. Scanners are handling close to one million of the 1983 returns at the IRS office in Kansas City. The new technology has been installed nationwide it's allowed IRS to reduce the number of its employees by 50% within the past two years. If there are no mistakes on a tax return and a refund is due, the machine can even send out a check. For all intents and purposes, the 1040Zs that, that are perfect, uh, have the labels, uh, you could claim they would be untouched by human hand. Scanners are being used to process the new 1040EZ. It's a simple one-page form designed to be read by a machine. The tax people hope they can refine the technology to scan more complex returns in the future. The IRS is also beefing up its computer system. More time will be spent double-checking information from banks and other financial institutions. Computers will tell on you if interest is not being reported as income. In some parts of the country, IRS will be using computerized mailing lists from private corporations to find wealthy tax cheats. Well, I'm sure that in some respects it would appear that uh, add to the Big Brother concept. But there is so much 
paperwork and so many requirements in terms of information reporting that without the computer we could not check much of this information. And in order to ensure a continued voluntary compliance in our tax system, uh, the public has to be a, a feeling of confidence that, that everybody is paying their fair share. And the only way we can do that is to ensure that all of the information that is provided is checked, cross-checked, and that those who are reporting it have nothing to fear. Those who are not reporting all of their information, hopefully we're going to be able to determine that, and they will be paying their fair share. When government computers start comparing notes on you and me, it makes you realize 1984 is already here. But computers can also help. There are programs for your home computer that will make out your tax return or give advice on cutting taxes. Unfortunately, however, the risks from computers may not be limited to tax audits. Typing on word processors may create higher stress levels than those measured for air traffic controllers, especially if management doesn't know or care. Here's our report. Margaret Nottingham has been spending a lot of time at her home in Warren, Michigan. She's on a medical leave from her job. Margaret required surgery on her hands because of a numbing condition called carpal tunnel disease. It's caused by continuous exertion on the wrist, pinching the nerves going into the hand. It's a common condition for people who work on assembly lines. But Margaret's employer is an insurance company. We always say we consider ourselves a uh, paper factory. That's what we consider ourselves. One of the highest stress um, occupations is a, a video display terminal operator. For eight hours a day, Margaret and 15 million other Americans tap away at keyboards on computers. The new tech office worker is becoming a one-job person. The same task is performed for hours at one workstation. There's no chance to get up and move about. Terminal operators complain about sore muscles. You know, girls would have shoulder problems, neck problems. Um, uh, they would uh, feel, you know, stiff when they would get up. Electronic equipment is being installed at a rapid pace. Some office managers don't worry about how the new machines will conform to the needs of those who operate the hardware. It's a problem that's being studied by a scientist at the University of Wisconsin. Robert Arndt says many of the aches and pains can be prevented with some common sense. We're now setting a keyboard on a table so we can't bring it in and set it on a desk. If we do a traditional height desk of uh, maybe uh, 30 inches, what I'd be doing is sitting with my arms way up here, and uh, that may be uncomfortable, especially if there's no place to rest my arms. If I've got a place to rest my hands, it may not be so bad. So, um, as with the old typewriter, you had to find a place on the desk to make it lower. Arndt is doing research on something called ergonomics. It's the science of making machines conform to people instead of making the body adjust to some new device. We get complaints about eye strain. The types of problems we could identify would be things like glare on the screen here uh, or reflections from the overhead lights. So when we bring this display into a work environment, we have to realize that that's going to happen. So we may have to turn the lights down a little bit uh, so we can see the screen better. We may have to uh, uh, put something over the light to cover it up uh, so it doesn't aim directly down. We may have to make sure there are no windows above the screen which are going to cause glare in my eyes. When we first started talking to the company about eye problems, we were told that we were watching too much television at home. We have to learn how to adapt. We can put filters on these. Uh, this particular table, for example, you can tilt it and maybe by tilting it you can actually eliminate uh, the glare uh, or the reflection from the screen. Now, when I, when I sit in front of a tube for eight hours and look at it, um, you can't tell me that if I have an eye problem, it couldn't have been caused from work. There are certain people who believe that in order to maximize the efficiency of someone I'm setting down in front of this expensive equipment I'm buying, that what I should do is make their job as simple as I can and repetitive. 
So I may be sitting in this chair for two hours at a time, whereas I used to get up every 25 minutes or 30 minutes to go to a filing cabinet. Now I push a button and I can bring everything into the file. It's on the file right onto the screen here. Arndt studied the working conditions at Wisconsin Bell Telephone. He teamed up with members of management and the Communication Workers Union. Together, they diffused the overhead lighting to reduce glare, and they installed new chairs. Those can provide better support for people who sit and use a computer for hours without a break. The manager of directory assistance claims the changes have vastly improved employee attitudes. They um, seem more willing to work overtime, for instance. Uh, because they aren't quite as tired. The eyes aren't quite as tired at the end of a tour. So I think uh, morale-wise, it's really helped a lot. Not every company will buy new furniture or replace the lights. Some managers don't believe that complaints are valid. Their skepticism is backed by scientific and government reports. Those reports acknowledge discomfort, but they do not show any evidence that things such as blurred vision and backaches are permanent. So should companies spend money to make the employees comfortable? Every company should. They're losing a lot by not listening to their workers. Granted, you can't change everything. You can't make everything perfect, and it can't all be done right now today. But uh, if, if the employees see that you truly are interested in them, uh, they're going to go the extra mile for you, too. Eye strain is the least of it. Computer terminals may shoot an electron ray gun at you 15,000 times a second with up to 25,000 volts and radiation from the kind in your microwave oven through x-rays to the kind of gamma rays and atomic bombs. Some reports link computer exposure to high rates of miscarriages and birth defects. There are suspicions of cancer and cataracts. Others reject such concerns. They say there's more radiation in one annual chest x-ray or a hair dryer. We'll be watching this story for you. Meanwhile, I ran into an old friend at the Consumer Electronics Show. He's Stephen Banker of the Canadian Broadcasting Company. I thought you'd like to meet him. Now, Steve, you, uh, you're a contributor to the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation. Uh, so you're here presumably looking for the Canadian angle. Uh, what, uh, pray tell, is the Canadian angle at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas? Well, it's, uh, in it, sadly, in a way, the same angle that I find at uh, a lot of the shows that I, that I cover. And it is that uh, in order for a company to survive, it really has to export from Canada. Uh, and once it does export successfully, it tends to lose its identity as a Canadian company. You may not even know that Commodore started off as a Canadian company. Now it is the biggest in its price range of the uh, home computer uh, companies. And they have little or no connection with Canada in terms of its being uh, their base, their, their origins. It is true that they are quicker to do French language manuals uh, than, the, uh, than the other companies are. But uh, Canadian companies are desperate to get out of Canada, at least partly, because with the expenses involved in research and development in, in the age of electronics and the age of computerology, they have to. Are they having difficulty getting into the market uh, here in the States? Well, some are not having much. To, some are doing so very successfully because there's a great deal of, uh, of genius in Canada, the software, the Unix system. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of, of planning and uh, especially the kind of work that you can do in your head without having to have million dollar pieces of equipment. So a lot of them are being very successful and are, and are doing very well. But the companies that are, are manufacturing things, PBX telephone switches, for instance, they have to get into the U.S. market, which is 10 times the size of the Canadian market, and maybe even more than 10 times when you consider the extent to which the United States is, is open to that sort of thing. Steve, of the 80,000 people in attendance here, some 10,000 of them are from countries other than the United States. Uh, about 3,000 are from Japan alone. What is the international interest in this trade show here in the middle of the United States in Las Vegas? Well, my sense is that this is a state of the art. We are seeing things here that are going to be available to consumers over the next uh, six months. And, and perhaps in some cases, even a longer lead time than that. People want to get uh, a leg up on the business. Uh, time is money. If you can predict what's going to happen, then uh, you're in a much better position uh, to make a living. And although it's true that uh, 
it is very worthwhile for people to go over to Tokyo and see what the Japanese are doing, so it is conversely true that the Japanese can learn a lot from what we're doing because our um, development of software is still well ahead of theirs. Steve, you've told us a lot about what's at the show this year, uh, but uh, you were telling me earlier you discovered uh, one rather notable uh, absence uh, from the show. The show is characterized by one absentee, as well as by all the companies that have come. We've been talking a great deal about IBM, about the, the PC, the personal computer, and the PC Junior, both of which, uh, well, the, the, the first of which has already dominated the market, and the second of which is expected to do in due course. IBM is not here. Everybody's talking about IBM. It, it, the idea of... Maybe uh, nobody told them about the show. Well, in order to understand the IBM marketing philosophy, one would have to be a Talmudic scholar. It is that inverse and complicated. They, they are geniuses. At marketing and advertising are the things that they do best. A lot of people, me included, feel that their product is not as good as it should be, but I certainly would not quarrel with anything they have done in the marketing and advertising field. Now, there are many better machines on the market. I happen to think that for a person who wants to do word processing like me, the Epson QX10 is a very valuable piece of equipment and much easier and more sensible to use uh, than the IBM. And yet the Epson is going for an MS-DOS card which will permit it to be compatible with the, his lordship IBM even, and so even are other companies. Even AT&T, which uh, one thinks of as a fairly substantial enterprise, uh, being larger than some 135 of the uh, nations of the United Nations or something, uh, even AT&T, with its projected uh, home computer, wants to make it IBM compatible. Nick, IBM is the 800-pound gorilla. It does what it wants to do. What do you do here in uh, covering this show? What are you looking for? I'm looking for something that's interesting. I'm looking for something that wakes me up. I have the feeling that uh, what sex was to the 1960s and real estate was to the 1970s and computers were to the beginning of the 80s, now consumer electronics, particularly telephones, are to this period of history. Something exciting, something changing, something where you can uh, make an investment of your time and it's not predictable. You don't really know where you're going to be. Telephones. Next... Well, telephones are exploding. You know, where Telephones they're... are exciting? Telephones are exciting. Telephones are doing all kinds of new things that they never did before. And many of them don't even look like telephones. It all has to do, of course, with the breakup of AT&T. Uh, but uh, I was acquainted uh, just today with a little a machine that can store 176 numbers that I can recall with just little memory tricks like mom or dad or doctor or house or Wait, you talk to it? No, you just you put, punch up maybe two letters like DR for doctor. Now, I don't know 176 people. I don't think there are more than 200 people in the whole world. But just to have this little thing sitting there gives you a sense of uh, how rapidly the telephone industry is taking advantage of the computer industry. And I think that's exciting, and that's what I came here to find out. Windows, I tell you about Windows. Computer companies are making VDTs, video display terminals, that is to say screens, uh, that you have to touch to change the function. Now you can say, I want to go from the calculator to the word processor, I want to go into the database management, all by touch. And then you can jump screens all around by touching. And there are many companies that are doing this. I decided after seeing this trend. Yes, what is the, what is the significance of well, this trend, Steve? Uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'm going to call my broker and say, buy stock in Windex. Windex is it. Windex is where it's going. You're going to have a lot of grease marks and <laughs> fingerprints on screens, you think? Well, you get it. What I'm really trying to say is that things are changing in a way, things are the same because the, the rate of change is about the same. But there are interesting little wrinkles to a show like this that happens twice a year in which you can plot the progress of what is available to the home user. Stephen Baker was one of more than 1,800 members of the media covering the show. Because whatever else consumer electronics may be, it's also news. Electronics has a way of popping up in a lot of unexpected places, like your grocery store. Here's a report on a new wave of grocery stores headed your way from California. I was so happy not to be in a regular grocery store. It was, I used to leave here yelling, and <laughs> this is great. I just find it convenient to phone from home, and then 
while I'm out doing errands just to run by for the groceries. We provide a home shopping catalog for our customers. It has everything in it that a customer would normally find in a large supermarket. Uh, they simply shop out of the catalog at their home or at their office, wherever, and phone us, tell us the item number of the items that they want to purchase, and then come by and pick them up. The computer will take that order, combine it with other customers' orders to make an efficient picking batch, sort it down into the same sequence that the merchandise is located in our warehouse so that we can pick it very quickly, and we then have people pick that order and put it together and along at the same time that they're doing several other orders. In reality, we split the perishables and the dry goods apart and two different people will do them. And then when the perishables are finished, they're actually put into temporary refrigeration units at the door awaiting the customer's arrival. The computer actually decides which items go in which bags. I mean, it, it, it actually bags the merchandise. It then also predetermines exactly where that merchandise is going to be sitting until the customer arrives so that when they do arrive, we can find it very quickly. The computer makes things more efficient all the way from start to finish because it in fact assists us in ordering our merchandise, keeping track of how much we have and how much we sold and therefore automatically being able to reorder. Uh, it allows us to pick it in a very efficient way so that the pickers never have to backtrack, uh, never have to uh, recheck. Well, the, the savings consists uh, both of uh, time and convenience but it also consists of money because price-wise we are able to, through the efficiencies of the computer, keep our prices down right with the lowest prices in the area. When the customer arrives, they stop at a little, what we call an announcement station. Uh, they key in their telephone number. Uh, it will then, again, remind them which door to go to and the exact amount they owe us so that they can start writing the check. And it will then send a message to the door to alert the people at the door that they're on their way. So usually we can have the merchandise out at curbside by the time the customer pulls up. We give them a nice detailed 8.5 by 11 invoice and they give us a check and they give us coupons if they have coupons and uh, the transaction is completed. Oh, it's really easy. I love it. My son Gregory and I live together and grocery shop on Saturdays with our own computerized grocery list. It also prints out items by aisle and calculates prices. We kind of like to pick our own items off the shelves. Besides, I remember electronic grocery shopping as a boy. You called the grocery store on the phone and they delivered to your door. But you have to hand it to those Californians. They have drive-in everything. And soon they will be able to contact the store directly with a home computer. Watch for their special on microchip ice cream. Would you like a simpler electronics hobby? Here's a suggestion from our old friend, Danny Goodman. I think I found what just might be the ideal high-tech hobby. It doesn't take a lot of money to get into it. It goes just about everywhere you want to go. It's great for kids and adults, and you don't have to keep buying supplies for it. It's called shortwave listening. Now, we can't see all the radio waves that bombard us all the time, but some of those waves have traveled literally halfway around the globe to get to us. And if we want to hear what they have to say, all we need is a reasonably sensitive shortwave receiver like these here. And some of the technology in some of these receivers lets us tune into these stations just as easy as changing channels on a TV set. About 40 different countries broadcast in English to North America every day. Programming consists largely of news, commentaries, music, and some local cultural programs to give us a flavor of what these countries are like. We can hear anything from South Africa, Australia, Israel, Radio Moscow if we want to. Now, I suggest if you want to get into this hobby that you start with an above-average desktop or portable receiver. And they should have digital frequency readout. All you need is a schedule like this, the World Radio TV Handbook. Look up the times and the frequencies, and then just dial in the exact frequency. Now, desktop receivers like this one from Kenwood and this one from Panasonic in the $500 range do an excellent job in picking up 
stations from all over the world with a simple wire antenna, either indoors or out. But if you're on the go, you can go with a portable receiver like this Sony, which has a frequency, direct readout and memories, and even with the telescoping antenna, will do a, a good job at bringing in the stronger stations. And it fits inside a suitcase in the corner of a briefcase and is good for international travel when you want to hear a familiar voice. Shortwave listening can be a real geography and current events learning experience for the youngsters in your family and great fun for everyone. In fact, a lot of ham radio operators started out by tuning the international broadcasting bands. Why don't you give it a try? Danny and I both started our interest in electronics with the excitement of shortwave listening and both expanded it into the hobby of amateur or ham radio. I still have a shortwave radio by my bed. I still get a thrill out of hearing those voices from thousands of miles away. And besides, when we're going to bed, the BBC is reporting the headlines in tomorrow's papers. I always sleep a little better knowing there won't be any surprises before dawn. Until next week, for the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Tech Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, the CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to program number 118, the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or you can now communicate electronically with the New Tech Times. Just call the source or CompuServe and select the New Tech Times online.